Nature favored this part of the world. Pleasant climate, fertile soil, pine forest, and the Tar River attracted settlers early in the 18th century and through time and change has sustained a community where people live and work together. Agriculture, industry, technology, through periods of innovation and change, helped make the place. But the story we have to tell is the story of people, the people of Edgecombe County and the town of Tarboro. I was born in 1907, so I'm 100 years old, a little over. <laughs> and I had a lot of attention when my birthday came in January. And they had my name up on the top of a building here. And I thought they'd never take it down. <laughs> I got embarrassed with that name up on the top. But uh, it was mighty nice, everybody paying attention to me. I was a hall before I got married, but um, I found a young man that I thought was right cute, and so I hung on to him until I caught him. And the first time I saw him, I said, what? well, where are you from? He said, I'm from Staten, Virginia. I'm an Episcopalian, and I play cards and dance. And I thought that was the cutest thing, because in those days, everybody didn't play cards and dance. The Baptists maybe didn't, and I don't know who else, but anyway, I thought, well, I'm going to hang on to this young gentleman. <laughs> so we did finally get married. Well, I taught school before I got married, but when I got married, I lost my job because they didn't hire married teachers. So that was a long time ago. So I built a little house in the back of mine here for my kindergarten. So I had kindergarten in the backyard. And I had waiting lists most of the times. Most of the times the mothers, is, is when they knew they were going to have a little child, they uh, always signed up because I couldn't take the 25. That was as much as I could handle. <laughs> couldn't keep my hands on that any more than that. <laughs> I tried teach them a few things about how to play together, but it, I enjoyed it. And I've been saying that none of them did anything, ever got in any trouble later. And if they have, I haven't heard about it. So I, yeah. <laughs> I can't say I was responsible, but it, I just had a good class. One time they put in the paper that I had the cream of the crop. Well, I didn't want that said because there were some others that were just as sweet that couldn't come to kindergarten, that couldn't pay for it. But uh, I, the ones I had were the cream of the crop, and I enjoyed them. I could handle them, and they were sweet, and they didn't mind being kissed and hugged and I was raised on a farm, but don't confuse me as being a farmer. I can't stand farming. The only thing I like about the farm is living on it, but I don't like anything about farming, not one damn thing that I have been able to find out that I like about farming. I got some, I got some bad stories. I got some bad stories about farming. I can tell you, I, it made me sick to get up in the morning, <laughs> go out in the field, and as hot as it was, you know, like today get in the tobacco pack and try to, try to prime the back, that was tough. It was good in one way, and then it was bad in another way because you had to work. But once you started working, you know, it was okay. They would go out to my grandpa's house and, and, and my mother's father. They had a farm. We did tobacco and cotton out there some. 
they worked in back. I was a little small at that time, but my grandfather would take us and my baby sister and me in the field, and we would sucker tobacco. And we would say, Grand Grandpa, my back is tired. He'd say, you shut up, gal, you don't have no back. <laughs> There's great tobacco in Edgecombe County. This is, this is a very much desired tobacco in, like in this region. And so they're growing more tobacco now in Edgecombe County than they ever have. There's some huge farms, huge tobacco farms right now, growing hundreds of acres. When you prime tobacco, you do it in stages. You start with the lower leaves, and then the middle leaves, and then the top leaves, work right on up the stalk until there's no tobacco left. Probably takes about four times to go across the field before you get all the tobacco prime. It takes about a month to probably get that done. And that is always done in August, which is, just, that's no other time you pick it. And in August in, in Edgecombe County, is, uh, that's, pretty, that's pretty bad. And, and there's no hotter place in, in the tobacco patch, to say, because you can't get a breath of air anywhere. It's just covered up by all those leaves, all those gums, all those worms and everything else. And you use long, wearing long sleeve shirt so you can keep all the gum and stuff off of you. So it's a, it's a very, very hot, hot time. So I, I stayed in the shelter most of the time when they bring the trucks of tobacco up to the place uh, I would just hand tobacco. I used to truck tobacco also. Go out in the field and change truck, take an empty truck and bring back the full truck of tobacco and go up under the uh, shed with it. And I would have to hand it tobacco. Hand it tobacco, you take three leaves and hand it to the person that was looping. Then you pass it to someone else and they would hang it up in the tobacco barn. This is 50 years ago. They don't do that anymore like that now. Nothing is they just put it in a barn, just stuff it in a barn as much as you can and, and cure it and then stuff it in a bag and carry it to the market and that's it. So, uh, but it used to be every, every leaf was gone through by hand and graded you know, for the color and, and, and all this types of things. And so, uh, but that was, that was not done like that anymore. It's a lot different. But you still got to get it in the, in the field and pick it by hand. There's no, there's no other way to do it. But I'll tell you, there's some good things about the farm too that I'd really enjoyed, and that was peanut season, peanut picking season. The farmer would plow the peanuts up with the plow and you, you shake them and they had this, uh, something like a pole, put a cross on it. You shake the peanuts and put them like that until you got to the top. You call that a stack. We had stacks for peanuts. They didn't, they didn't pick them in bulk like they used to. They used to stack them on, on poles. You had to go in. The people went to the woods and just cut down saplings, put cross tiles on the bottom of it to keep the peanuts from hitting the ground and stack them on top of the cross, cross tiles at the bottom on, on the stacks. And uh, now they just put them in the wagon, blow them dry with heat and air, and in two days they're dry. It used to take about six to eight weeks to dry the peanuts in the field. And they just had a naturally dry air dry in the field. And you just had beautiful stacks of peanuts. Back then it was cold when you picked peanuts. Now it's hot because you're done by picking peanuts in the middle of October. But back then, you, December, November and December is when you picked peanuts and so it was getting cold. And so to pick peanuts, you had to have a little fire in the field and throw handfuls of peanuts in the coals of that, and you've never tasted a better peanut in your life than roasted right there in the field on, on those hot coals. You can't get it in the house to, to taste that way. It, you just can't. It's the finest taste in the world. And that was fun. The peanut picker was stationary, and it had a belt tied to a tractor, and the tractor had a, had a wheel, a pulley on it that, uh, that turned the combine. And, uh, that's, and you, so you hand fed the, the peanuts into the thresher and it came out the back end. If the hay came out the back end, the peanuts came out the side and came into a bag that had 100 pound bags of peanuts that they tied up and carried to market. That's the way they carried them then. Instead of big old wagon full, just dumped them into a pit now. But that's the way they used to do peanuts. Well, when they, they bring the stacks up to the picker and they bring them on sleds. So they put three stacks of peanuts on a sled and they were pulled by two mules. And the sled was just, just boards tied together uh, and the slick part on the ground, just sliding along the ground, on the bare ground because the ground was bare because the peanuts were on the stacks and so the ground was just bare. I used to love to ride that sled. That was the most fun thing in the world. The weather was cool. 
no, no hot, no hot chopping peanuts then. The peanuts time was good then. I tell you, it was really good. So uh, we get on the sled and ride around because every time you get two dirt clods in your hand, and every time a peanut stack was turned over and put on the sled, there's going to be a mouse coming up from under that. And so we killed mice all day, gone day long, coming up from under the haystack, throwing dirt, dirt clods at them. That was fun. That was a lot of fun. Never liked to do cotton. I never liked it. She told me what she was going to do to me if I did not pick 100 pounds of cotton. So every, all types of water I put in that, all types of water I put in that sheet. You bring your water, I don't care what kind of oil you put in that sheet to make it be 100. So I got 105 pounds of cotton. I was praised that day. But thereafter, she expected me to get 100 pounds, and I didn't do it. So I got a little switching. It wasn't a switching. That was a killing. <laughs> Every day. The cotton is light because it's fluffy, you know, and you have to use a bag to put it in to uh, get enough to uh, make a pile. Get uh, at least, um, the aim was to at least try to get a hundred pounds, you know, and it was hard. So uh, you had to do a lot of picking to get it. But now some of the boys who laid around the sheet or who would be, you know, could go there and post a warrant in there. But now the boss man would always, he could detect that, you know. He could detect that. And so uh, it didn't happen a lot. But we try, they try, you know. Mm -hmm. We had a sheet that we poured the cotton on, okay. We had a long bag with a, uh, strap on it that we put across our shoulder. And that when we picked, we put our cotton in the bag. When we got enough in the sack, uh, we call it the cotton sack. And we, when we got enough in the sack, you know, if we were old enough to go and empty it ourselves, we did, but our parents or whoever our uh, chaperone was would uh, take us to the sheet and pull the, pull the cotton out for us. Mm -hmm. Then they would, uh, weigh the cotton in the evening, you know, and you know how much, I never really picked over 65 pounds but one time. They didn't pay much, you know, at that time, sometimes it was around, when I first started, it was around 50 cent, and then the children got less, you know, 50 cent, uh, not 50 cent a pound, but 50 cent per hundred. You know, we weren't making a lot of money back then. And a person who would, could make uh, eight or ten dollars in the field a day did good, and they were mostly adults, but you had some children who could really pick it, you know. I grew up, essentially I grew up here, uh, relatively unexciting childhood, but um, I do remember a considerable amount about the Great Depression, which uh, hit the United States and Tarver included uh, in the 20s, in the late 20s. The stock market, of course, went all to pieces, and this Tarboro was an based on an agricultural economy, Tarboro in Edgecombe County. And as the price of commodities went up and down, that uh, affected the economy and everything. The, the, the Depression days were, uh, I, I remember quite, quite well. I remember, of course, everybody sat on the porch, there was no air conditioning, and it wasn't unusual at all for somebody to come by and ask for something to eat. I can remember at both homes, the people uh, knocking on our back door. We didn't mind going to a back door then, and, and you uh, open the door, and they say, do you have anything to eat extra? And my mother never threw away anything like food. She kept it. 
because they were coming by all the time. People didn't have the food. And so, and people, and out in the county too, taking food, especially on Saturdays, we'd ride out. Had certain families who'd take food too. All you did was blow the horn, they'd come out. They were thrilled to death. Thrilled to death. The Depression, oh, that was a horrible time. Horrible time, and so many people lost what they had, the farms or the homes. Or, oh, golly, it, it sticks with me right now to see a man and his family drive out. We lived out in the country in Tarboro, and uh, to see him drive out there to plead with Daddy, and I just, oh, it, not to plead, but to beg, you know, to let him stay on. And, and I'm sure he did, but it hurt so to know that they had nothing, nothing. And there were so many, as you all have read, suicides in that time when everybody just couldn't take care of the families, couldn't take care of themselves. I hope that never happens again. It was a time that if you hadn't been there and seen how low down the people could get, you can't know it, and, and your just heart would go out to them, but you felt powerless to do anything. The, the mills all operated. Uh, the cotton mills, Hart Cotton Mill, which was the main one that made, um, made uh, they called it unbleached domestic, which is basically sheeting. And they ran uh, six, uh, six days a week, 24 hours a day. They'd close up at midnight Saturday night and open, open, uh, open up uh, Sunday night, a minute past 12. But their prices, ch cheaper labor, they, they were able to continue on during the Depression. The, the farmers all had a bad time. Of course, cotton was like eight, eight cents or so. And a lot of farmers, people lost their farms and land. It, 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 wasn't, it wasn't easy times for anyone. My name is Hurdley Roundtree. I was born in 1911 in Nanson County, Virginia. <laughs> Just over the line in Virginia I was born. I lived here since 1927. It was Hoover's time. Back in the day, people were grasped everything they could get along. Uh, and uh, my dad lost his farm the year before that. He had a farm over in Virginia. And he, he, he lost, lost everything he had. And the, the family, we, we stayed, worked at, he worked at a stave mill, if you don't know what a stave mill is. It's a mill that <coughs> was circular saws that make barrel staves that you use them to ship ice potatoes in back in those days. They don't use them now. But, uh, uh, and he, he just out hunting a place for his family to go. And, and we come down here, he knew somebody already at this, was at this mill. And, the, and they were looking for people with women. Women work, mostly women. The knitting room up there would have, uh, probably a hundred women and three men in it. The women, the men just mechanics was all there was up there. A running meat, running meat hoser mill. And they only made a, only made men's socks. Hoser was a business back in those days. And uh, that's, and that's why, that's why we were here. You come here <coughs> and all these houses you see around here belong to the mill. They were all brown. <laughs> Yeah, all painted the same color. I started to work for 10 cents an hour. <laughs> that was kind of, kind of, don't sound right, but that's what it was. That's, that's what you, that's what your pay was. I made $6 a week and I brought it home and handed it over to Ma because she had to, she had to have it, keep us from going hungry, I think. But times were tough then. I heard the, Hillary Clinton say in the speech not long ago, said it's just like Hoover's time. I said she won't live in the, she won't live in Hoover's time. <laughs> she, she, she wouldn't have made it like that. Uh, it was 
Well, there wasn't any, any welfare if you didn't have anything to eat while well, you got out and done the best you could. The company here at that time had a company store. So if you lived in the house, you could work, if you worked in the mill, you could live in the house and trade at the store. So that was about as good as could be. <laughs> uh, and so that's, that's, that's the way we started. Well, a uh, Hoover cart, <clears throat> there was no way uh, to buy tires, get them money for tires or engine repair, even for gasoline. So you would take, say, a Model, model T Ford and cut, cut it in half, put shafts in it, and hook up the mule to it. And you sit in the, be the back seat and the back wheels. And um, you'd put rags or rope in the tires, because the tires are worn out. And there were many of them all, all over the st streets of Tarboro. You know, during the Depression, something uh, that sort of fascinated me about that, and I, and I didn't myself personally remember, I was born in 35, but I don't remember, you know, Depression days at all as a child. But I understand that oh, people, particularly tenant farmers, and keep in mind that, you know, in the early 1900s, in an agricultural setting like this, there would have been lots of tenant farmers who were helping landowners, you know, on their farms. And, uh, but tenant farmers who had a death in the family uh, would not be able to, uh, you know, afford the services of the funeral home and having someone laid in rest with all the attention that a funeral home would give. An arrangement that took place at the Donald Everett store was to have the undertaker come down and do the embalming at Daniel Everett store. And then the body would be put in a casket and it would be propped up in a large window of that store where people could come by and view the body over you know, several days period of time. And then after that, the burial would take place. And it was, my, I remember my mother telling, you know, what a strange sight to pass that window and see a body propped up in a casket for you to look to view. In about 1930, uh, it was sitting in, in neglect the federal government was giving money away to communities to kind of help uh, recover from the from the uh, depression, and uh, the town of Tarboro bought the house and they built a swimming pool and they uh, installed the uh, town offices there. There was a library there. There was a meeting room there where uh, all kinds of events could take place. And so it was very active um, for, for decades as a community center. There was a great um, clamor by the young people, understandably, uh, I was one of them, uh, for a swimming pool because the only places to swim in Tarver were the Tar River, which was quite dangerous, and uh, Hendricks Creek, which uh, was quite unsatisfactory. So uh, I remember very well the pool as it uh, the uh, approaching the uh, campaign for it. The young people walked around, marched around town uh, one night with uh, torches and all. And if any of the commissioners were unfortunate enough to live within the bounds of Tarbra, they can't stop in front of their house and start chanting, uh, we want a swimming pool, we want a swimming pool, we tell the world, we tell the world, we want a swimming pool. And uh, by golly, it worked. And they got the municipal pool, it was a very good one. Everybody in our crowds went to the swimming pool. It was wonderful, and we'd have season passes. And see, we'd just show that pass. If you didn't have a pass, you'd pay five cents an hour. And they had a loud bell, and you had to get out of that, uh, 
swimming pool on the hour. It was, everybody got out, went out, and then you came back in. Some people, see, had paid five cents. So you've got to show your pass every hour if you're going back, or if you pay another nickel. And then when we went swimming up there on those back steps at the Blunt Bridges house, they had steps on each side of those steps. The girls' locker room was on the base, in the basement on the left, and the boys on the right. And you'd what might go up there in your clothes, and you didn't have lockers with doors. Just had these open slots. You'd put your little old money in there, your clothes in there, your towel in there, and go if you want to stay all day at the swimming pool. And then you'd take a break, and they had a little store there, and Mr. M.S. Brown had all the Coca-Colas and had candy bars in the boxes, Milky Ways and such, and you'd buy a candy bar. You could get it hot or cold in the box or in the cooler. And it was hot then. You probably got a lot of them when they were cool, you know, the candy bars. Then you talk to your friends. And Tom, incidentally, had a Cracker Jack swimming team, and it was used for AAU meets, which were newsworthy because I remember when I was um, at my first station in Montgomery, Alabama, air base, uh, I went to the movie one night, and here was a Fox Movie Tone News and a clip from Tarbar showing a, a AAU swimming meet with uh, swimmers from all over the southeast participating. In the 10th annual Carolina AAU Aquatic Championships, the camera follows the star performers of the meet with headliners of the armed forces dominating the show. In the service men's 200-meter freestyle event, the pacemaker of them all is the pride of Bainbridge, Wally Reese. In a 200-meter breaststroke, another speedy test of racing form, the side wheelers churn the pool to a froth as a pool record topples when the Marines produce the winner and trainee, Billy Kelly, the time 2 minutes 51 and 6 ten seconds, and a pictorial exhibition by the past master of the backstroke champs, the Navy's Adolph Kiefer, who displays his old-time championship form and the great stroke that brought him many a swimming crown. And then a finale to the aquatic show, when into the picture comes a water ballet team to form the target for the swan dive by Sergeant Featherstone, who executes his graceful nip-up not once, but twice, and the water sirens do an off to Buffalo into Papa Neptune's realm. The highlight in the summer was a beauty contest, but then you had to be beautiful. Now, you see these contests, you wonder how they got in. But look, you didn't have to have a talent. If you were pretty, you could be in it. And they put bleachers up on the side, all four sides of the pool. And you'd get your seat, and the girls would just, you didn't have the time, they'd just walk all around the inside of the pool, and the judges there were judging them. And everybody in town would, would uh, come there for that event. And, it, and Mr. M.S. Brown took thousands and thousands of pictures of, of that. That swimming pool, was known all over, all over the state of North Carolina, more so than Charlotte. We had the size of it, our famous swimmers. We had uh, all, all these swimming meets here. That's what you did, you'd go see uh, the people at swimming meets. So we met friends, see.
remember the last couple of years we were in college, the newsreels that were talking so much and showing us so many pictures of Europe and what was going on. And of course that was a time when everybody was concerned about what is going to happen to the United States. Should, should we get in and help, uh, whatever, what we should do? And we were worried about communists and communism. And I remember uh, we were talking about some professors that we thought probably were communists. And they probably were not. I graduated from college in 1941 and uh, was on my way to California to visit my sister when I stopped off in Salt Lake City overnight to see a friend of mine. And she said, how about spending a few days here with me? So I pulled my bags off the train and uh, said, sure I will. And that was December the 7th, 1941. The next day, uh, we heard on the radio that the Japanese had bombed Pearl Harbor. I was in starting my second year of law school when draft was instituted, and this was before Pearl Harbor, and I thought that uh, certainly since there was no war going at the time, that I would be deferred, and my number was down the list, but that was in August, and the following June, I received a notice from the draft board that I had been chosen to enter the service. I had wanted to go in the service and get my duty, but not until I finished my third year law. I uh, volunteered with the Red Cross and went overseas in 1943, and we landed in Casablanca. And the first thing we did when we got to Casablanca was look for Rick's place because we'd all seen the movie <laughs> and were disappointed to find out that Rick's place did not exist. From Casablanca, they sent me to Oran, North Africa, and, and uh, to an enlisted men's club. And the army had taken over a big casino that was a, uh, encased an entire block. So we got GIs that were coming in, fresh, green, from the States, and then we had GIs who had been up to Tunisia and gone through the hells of war and had pulled back. So we, it was a, a wonderful place for GIs to come in and mix. On the bottom floor, we had a ballroom and a theater, a library, a sun deck, a record room where they could play records. So it was a great place for them to get away from what they had seen and been through and come and just kind of hang out with Red Cross girls. I was in some pretty desolate areas in the deserts of Libya and, and uh, Egypt and, and, and Italy and, and India and China. So I moved around quite a bit and most of them were not uh, places that you'd want to spend a whole lot of time. And yeah, I did, but uh, it made you appreciate things more. From uh, there, I went to Italy with the 15th Air Force in a place called Foggia. And that's where I met my husband. Our job then was to take coffee and donuts out and meet the planes as they were coming in. And uh, my husband, Gene Simmons, a Tarboro native, who was also called the Silver Tongue of the South. <laughs> uh, see, I came up to, the, to my donut stand and said, I'll take three. And I'd heard him talk, and I said, you'll take two Magnolia Mouth, just like everybody else. And that was the beginning of a, of a romance that lasted a long time. I was always struck with the poverty in North Africa and the poverty in Italy and what war does to countries. Uh, when I would come back from uh, carrying the donuts, if there were any left, I would always give them to the children and they would surround 
uh, begging for cake, cake, and al almost attacked me to get something to eat. So it, uh, war is, uh, does terrible things. Uh, I, I sp spent the, primarily the war, war in high school. I graduated in 1945, war years in, in, uh, in high school. And towards, and towards the end of the war, Every man in town, uh, or, or almost certainly every man in town, either e e every male either looked like me or my father. Everybody in between was gone. They'd been drafted or just left town for a, a better job. And the, we in high school did a great deal just to keep the town going. I tell you, our crowd, with the war in the 40s, we were born say, in 32. And with the war coming on up as we got little old 10 years old. So. But you know, I remember we were patriotic. We knew all the songs of the military, the Army, and Marines. We knew all those songs. I think on Sunday afternoon or Saturday afternoon, uh, the Girl Scouts, we would meet at the uh, picture show. Uh, and um, I still say picture show, <laughs> take off our berets and uh, turn them inside out, and that's what we used to pass them up and down those rows at the picture show. And everyone gave money for the war then. And I tell you one thing we did, it was a hot job. We'd go to that old milk plant down here, and the farmers would bring vegetables in, and they would can actually in the cans, canned string beans, butter beans, tomatoes. They would do all that canning for the army, send it for the troops. And I don't what they had, I think we should maybe put in a corner and snap beans. But we did it as part of our patriotic duty. And see, enjoyed it. It was so hot down there as you can believe. But we did it, nobody thought about that then. And all the death notice and missing, missing in action notices came through the telegraph office. And Billy, who was probably 17 years old, was delivering such messages. Now he would go into homes where only the mother or the wife would be there. And here's a 17 year old trying to console a hysterical mother or wife. And he would even go out on his bicycle in the county deliver them. After the, when the invasion of Europe occurred, that's when the death notices started coming into the county. And finally somebody found out, Billy was a quiet fellow. He didn't say anything about this. Finally somebody in town found out what was going on. And they alerted the ministers in town, that, you know, somebody's got to go with Billy. And the minister said, well, we'll, we'll gladly go, just tell us when. So the telegraph operator would, would, would had a telephone number to call and some, some minister would go with Billy to deliver the, to deliver the uh, death notice. We also had a um, lookout stand um, that citizens manned 24 hours uh, citing and describing planes that they could during the day and at night then reporting in proximity of where they thought the plane was and um, described it best they could. Everybody just kind of chipped in and, and uh, did whatever they could to keep things going till, 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 the, till the men got home. <laughs> Had a whole lot of the women that left town also for better paying jobs and joined the uh, and join the military. We closed the high school one day. Uh, well, you didn't close it. You could go to high, go to go to school, and if you wanted to get on a truck and go out in the county and help with the peanut harvest, you could. And of course, just about everybody said, you know, we'll take peanuts over over algebra anytime. So we all go out. We were stacking peanuts, and so that was a job to pick them up and and take them over the pole and stack them. And you had to keep count of how many po uh, stacks you made. I think you got 10 cents a stack. <clears throat> well, I came home that night, steps to the front house, to the, there were three steps on the porch. And I was so 
tired. I had to sit down to get up. I'd never been worked that hard or been that tired in my life. They've had to call on school children, uh, I'm sure, in all of eastern North Carolina when it came time to harvest those crops. Because they, they would have been just left. We were let out of school, which was uh, wonderful, and taken by the school buses out to surrounding farms and fields to pick cotton. And I remember also working on um, gathering hay for haystacks. We had breaks and just made the haystacks. And uh, got in trouble sometimes playing them, but we enjoyed that kind of fun. The town also had brought in Italian prisoners, and they lived in the ballpark. And I remember on uh, Sundays, Sunday afternoons, they would march past my house, which was two houses down from a little Catholic church. And so they would get to come to Mass. And I remember one Sunday, Mama had a lot of cookies from something. I got to share cookies with those prisoners and they were all in line marching right to church and they really helped with the harvest because you see most all the men around here had gone to war. They uh, captured about a quarter of a million Italians in Africa and they had no way of taking care of a, t t uh, a quarter of a million men in Africa so they shipped them to this country, built prison camps all all around the country. And I, I'm sure there were prison camps in North Carolina, but these were volunteers for these prison camps that were willing to go out and help with the harvest. So they brought the Italian prisoners to town and put them in the ballpark, where the ballpark is today, and kept them here about a, about a month. And they would go out and, and primarily the, the, the big, biggest concern was the peanut crop. Uh, peanuts were vital to the war effort and it, a lot of hand labor involved and uh, a lot of physical labor as pointed out by crawling up the steps. So the Italians pl played a big part uh, in that. And I think they had probably several hundred Italian prisoners and maybe a dozen guards that <laughs> those fellows weren't going anyplace. And each Sunday afternoon, <clears throat> they would march them down, those who wanted to go, down to the town common, where they'd line up in military precision and sing grand opera. It was just amazing. I would r ride down to hear them on Sunday on my bicycle, and there would be one other person in town down there, uh, uh, Britt Nash. He's the only one in, I've ever talked to that re remembers the uh, Italian prisoners of war singing grand opera on the uh, on the town common. And I guess nobody in town, uh, you know, the, these fellows were shooting at their loved ones just a few months earlier and they didn't care to go down and hear them sing. But uh, it, it was it, it, it was a delight and, and kind of the tragedy of war that you know you'd be killing one one another one month and singing grand opera you know, in the, the, the opponent's hometown a few months later all part of the peanut harvest <laughs> i might say <laughs> i had been over there 18 months and i was i was kind of worn out so i decided i'd come home and he said you must go to tarboro and meet my family well, we came into Boston in uh, freezing weather with worn out clothes and holes in our shoes. And I plopped my way down <laughs> to get on the train with, it seemed like thousands more GIs uh, moving south. And we got in Rocky Mount and I 
got off the train and um, with lots of soldiers getting off and I saw this woman running alongside the train with her arms wide open and it was Jean's mother, Mary Simmons. And she personified everything Jean had ever told me about Tarboro. It's a, a different feeling, you know, and I, being an only child, was very close to my parents, but uh, it was uh, like I got to get acquainted with these folks all over again. Of course, when I came home, I was still in the service. The war hadn't ended, and I had this 30-day leave, uh, and then I was shipped to be reassigned, but it was uh, happened to be shipped to Greensboro. And before the reassignment came, VJ Day occurred, uh, victory in Japan, and that uh, triggered a release of, of uh, a lot of people from the service earlier than they expected. It was a big celebration when we all gathered in the commons and the mill whistle blew forever. The church bells rang. We really celebrated when we got the news of the end of the war. Well, you know, um, everybody was so glad to get back, but, and I felt the same way the GIs did. When they were coming back, they couldn't wait to get here. When we got off the ship, I remember them jumping off and kissing the ground. But there was always this, there was always this thing. Now, what is, what what's next? We've been in a strange situation for years, and what what's it going to be like to come home? And it, everybody made that adjustment. Everybody had that same feeling. Um, I must say that when I was in the Red Cross, I never had uh, a, f a feeling of, uh, I was never afraid. I really was never in any danger, but I, I always had the feeling that the whole American army was looking after me. Nothing could happen to me with that. All those people taking care of me, keeping, keeping this whole world safe. Uh, so it was an adjustment to come to Tarboro, but as I said, there, it was, Tarboro has been a wonderful place and I feel a, a deep sense of gratitude for the welcome that I got, for the comfort that I received and the wonderful people that I loved and I laughed with and have lived with. So it's been a, it's been a good ride. swimming out there and enjoying life. I wanted to uh, swim and uh, we could uh, see them swimming, the children, and uh, we could go and stay a little while. One of the times I was going by there, my mother had picked some blackberries and we were selling the berries. And my sister, I was with my sisters, my two older sisters. And so, uh, you know, we had to go and take a peep. So <laughs> we, could, we could look because they had this fence, iron fence around it. And uh, that's the way it was. And, but going to the pool, no, we couldn't go in the gate. We had to, if we saw them, we had to be on the outside, stand out there. And, uh, but I didn't have any heckling from the inside. You know, we didn't have any. I didn't experience any heckling from the inside. Everybody could, you could, if you wanted to look, you could look. <laughs> if you wanted, and that's that. We couldn't go in certain places, like the bus station in the front. We couldn't go there in the front. And uh, we couldn't go in the, uh, in of their buildings and things to the front, we would have to use a side door or a back door. You know, at restaurants, they had, didn't have that many here in town, but they had some. If we got any food from there, we had to go to the back door. Well, first of all, if you consider the culture of the time, it was heavy duty segregation. And the fact that my dad would, you know, a fifth grade dropout would 
do all this, get to med school and be brilliant in his career was like amazing. It was totally amazing. After he finished med school, he contacted a friend who was uh, practicing in Rocky Mount, and his friend said, don't come here, I, I got this covered, but Tarboro needs a place. The uh, black doctor who was here before my dad um, had retired, he was old, very, very old, um, and they needed someone else here. So um, he came to Tarboro with $7 in his pocket. He put five in the collection plate over at St. Paul AME Zion Church and uh, he kept the two dollars for himself and he started from there. There was Edgecombe General Hospital, but they would not give him operating privileges there or any kind of space for having an office there because of the Jim Crow laws and, and, and the culture of that time. He got help um, from some of the townspeople here. He renovated an old fish market where the clinic now stands and uh, he had some of the patients help make curtains and so that was his medical office. It was life-saving. It was life-saving, literally life-saving, because the conditions for blacks at Eshcom General were not good. Um, they got the worst of the worst care there. At least down at the clinic they had a chance. And it was a big deal. It was a big deal. For that time it was a state-of-the-art kind of place. A doctor now would not even conceive of trying to do this themselves. I had a male, a female ward. Most of my patients were women anyhow. That was three times the size of the male ward. I had a similar private room, private room. I had the x-ray department. And, had, you know, and then I had a pharmacy. I had a dispensary where we could, patients would get the medicine cheaper than they could in the drugstore. I think he treated his first Caucasian patient in 1951. He, he had the first integrated hospital around here. That was attitude back in those days, but, but I'd been here about, you know, a hospital over about five years. And a man came in and I looked in there, the white man was back there. And I said, what are you doing back here? He said, damn it, the hell, this rheumatism is killing me. I want some treatment. Uh, I let him stay, and that was the beginning. People ask me about my dad and, you know, his story is unique in its own way, but there are other black doctors out there doing the same or similar things. These black professionals doing this thing, getting through the system, getting through the Jim Crow system anyway, um, making a difference to, you know, the black communities and to the white communities. I say I want to practice medicine where I was needed. I didn't give a darn what happened. I wasn't letting anything stop me. We had wonderful leadership in the town. Dr. Ed Robertson was our mayor for um, 20 some years. And that's where I see my father it was sort of one of these hinges on which things uh, uh, moved. Um, and there was just a sophistication that came with uh, the uh, uh, urban development and with uh, uh, economic development, industrial development, uh, bringing Tarboro the pre-war uh, small town isolation that, that all southern towns were into the, the greater world uh, that we are now a part of. And I think Tarboro is sort of catapulted ahead of some eastern North Carolina towns because of the development that took place during that post-war era, the 60s, 70s, and 80s, and you know, with our industry and, and our presence in eastern North Carolina. And he was, he helped, he presided over as, as the mayor. We had some strife, but we didn't have a lot like they had, ever, you know. Um, as a matter of fact, during that time when all that strife was going on, uh, it wasn't a lot like we saw in other ci town, uh, cities, you know, like down in Alabama and stuff like that. And we didn't have, when they opened up the schools, we didn't have any, anybody to tell the children they couldn't come you know, like they did at the college, some of the colleges down south, you know. The young people at the high school felt like no one was talking to their age group. And yes, they might hear some things at home or at their church or whatever, but um, 
all of the students, black and white, said they would talk to Bob and a Baptist minister here, Monty Bishop. And they had several sessions at the high school with those young people. And so we didn't have um, the turmoil that some of the communities had. Dr. Ray was uh, the, a dentist here in town. He was the mayor pro tem for years, and he was a, uh, a black gentleman who was also interested in having things go real well. Um, and it was through his leadership that, uh, too, that uh, so many things went right. The children had gotten mad and left school and said they were going down there and they were going to tap some things, you know. <laughs> and so he said that, uh, Doc, when he got down there, Dr. Ray, who was, uh, he was the mayor pro team at that time, and he was down there trying to quiet the children. They had left school and the principal had called around to get some of the church men to come and help with the group, you know. And so, uh, so Doctor, when he got down there, said so Dr. Ray was trying, he and others, trying to quiet those children. Those children said, we're not going back to school, so we're going to go down here and we're going to tap some things or whatever they said. <laughs> he got before them and stood up there and said, now, if you go back to school, you know, we'll get things worked out, you know. And don't raise a lot of sand down here, downtown. You want to get put in jail and all of that. And and they told him, well, Mr. Wee, they knew him. If you want to stand up in the way, we're going to just walk over you. That was some of those bullets. <laughs> and so he said, well, you're going to have to do that. Say, I'm going to stand here. And he stood there with Dr. Ray and them. But then uh, some of the children, you know, got on his side and said, now, if you walk over Mr. Wee, we're going to get you. <laughs> and so that's how the crowd turned around. So much has been made um, of the violent things that happened that I think it's good to know that, and that you know there were all over the United States, places where um, reason took precedence over reaction. The Lord let us make it. Thank God. He brought us through. Mm -hmm. In 1981, when they closed up the swimming pool, I was watching them from an upstairs window at the Blunt Bridgers house crying and Watson Brown and Philip Guy went down and got this piece of concrete for me from the swimming pool and I have kept it ever since and I have wheeled it to my niece so it stays in the family. It was terrible. It was they were burying my childhood because I had spent so much time at the pool. But the Blunt Bridgers house and the restoration of the Blunt Bridgers house was a pivotal time in Tarboro's redevelopment. It was very active um, for, for decades as a community center. And um, then the library moved out when they built a new building. And the house was just sitting there. I think that the last municipal use uh, that I know of was for training uh, for the police SWAT teams. Uh, before the restoration started, there, were, uh, there was graffiti on the walls uh, with saying an uncomplimentary thing about cops. And, um, and, and, and they would roar up and down the stairs with their AK-47s or whatever it is that policemen carry. I don't know. <laughs> Uh, about 1978, uh, a, a group of people got together uh, with the uh, uh, then uh, mayor and a very active uh, historical society and uh, put together the uh, uh, Blunt Bridges House idea of having a museum, arts council, and community center and it, it, it took off. 
A person who was critically important in getting the project off the ground is Minnie Lou Parker Creech. She convinced the Tarboro Women's Club to donate funds which leveraged statewide financial aid. When Alice Weeks Gordon, who was Hobson Pittman's niece, um, decided that she wanted to have a repository for all of his work and she wanted it to come to Tarboro, but it had to be a gallery. It had to be somewhere official. It couldn't just be in a closet somewhere. And so she called my daddy and asked him if he would help her. And my daddy called Motsi Brooks. And Motsi is really who got the ball rolling. And Motsi got with Watson, who worked with the town. Watson Brown worked with the town. And the ball just started rolling. In 1976, Tarber established one of the first historic districts in North Carolina, and it remained one of the largest historic districts in the state uh, up until fairly recent history, uh, and has been successful, I think, in stabilizing a part of the town that had seen a fair amount of decline before that establishment. So with that, uh, one of the final projects we kind of ended up with was tackling the crown jewel of Tarboro and that was the, the Blunt House, uh, the Grove as it was known historically. Uh, that had been owned by the town since the Depression. It had been the city uh, town swimming pool site. We were able to get funding to get uh, another new, better, larger, uh, more competitive swimming pool built in Tarboro so that we could demolish the old swimming pool and then proceed to restore the whole block that the Blunt House uh, was on. It's still a community house. It's where people gather for art and music and movies. So see what a used place that was. And it was a center for everything. Blunt Bridges House is still very deeply involved in the, in the community and the community's life. These are the stories of Tarboro people. Not the whole story, but part of the story. It's not a perfect story, and it's a story that is still being lived and written. Dr. Moses Ray, mayor at the time, said it best some years ago. We have been able to face our problem and work for the solution. I'm not saying Tarbora is a utopia. We still have problems, but we are facing them. Tarbora is 
Chupacabra is a place where the warmth comes not only from the sun, but the hearts of the people. I won't say that. I didn't mean to say that. <laughs> I was being interesting. I know, but I, I, I forget that somebody else might hear this too. I felt like I was just talking to you too. <laughs> cut me off. Can you cut it off? Huh? What did you say? Tarver's a nice place. Everybody wants to find a good town. Tarver is it. <laughs> 